If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Mind Pump. Coming in hot. For the first 48 minutes, we were... Uh, Oh, we're a little aggressive. I think there nice, was like a rant that really? we all just felt we had to, yeah. to do there well, for a minute. Really? I didn't think we that. We talked about victimhood, toughness, resiliency, and growth. Uh, we talked about like, uh, what is it? What are those things called? Trigger warnings. A study came out showing <laughs> that trigger warnings, warnings actually make things worse. Duh. Right. Adam was calling everybody snowflakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you know snowflakes are, is like a disparaging term now they use for just the liberals? No. Yeah. No, it just means- I know what you mean by it. Yeah, it just means somebody who's delicate. Like too know? delicate. Yeah, yeah so yeah. delicate that no, you'd melt away or get fucking destroyed. No, now it means right. like so, but I know exactly what you're mean. So yeah. for people listening- that's what he means. Really? He doesn't mean liberals. He means delicate people. Yeah. How can they, they can't, they, they Some just, people will think that. You can't just take an adjective and just de- define what it is. Isn't that funny how yeah, that happens? Yeah, every time. Yeah, pretty, people yeah. do that. Pretty funny. We talk about a bigger, better argument for veganism. So we touched a lot of third rails in that first 48 minutes. Whew. And then we get into fitness. We talk about- uh, <laughs> stay, cor- stay with us. We talk about Adam's shoulder pain. Uh, he hurt himself again. It's trying to keep up with- Easy. I didn't hurt myself. Trying it's to, just some nagging shit try- going he's on. He's trying to keep up uh, with Justin, and he's having a oh, tough time keeping up with tough, Justin. It's a tough deal. Yeah, fighting for a second. Yeah. Uh, we talked about pain, mobility, a person's strength capacity. That was a fascinating part of this episode. Then we talked about our new back pain guide at mindpumpfree.com. If you have back pain- Go check out that free guide. I give you some tips on how you may be able to alleviate that back pain. Then we talked about techniques for improving performance, mobility, and for treating and preventing pain. Now, on that note, one of our best fitness programs to improve your mobility. Now, we're not talking about correctional exercise. That would be MAPS Prime or Prime Pro. I'm talking about our fitness programs. Like If you want a MAPS program that's actually a workout, Mm. but you also want to really improve your movement and mobility. In all directions. MAPS Performance is the program. MAPS Performance actually has mobility sessions sewed into the fabric of the program itself because we designed it for people who want to perform and push their bodies at high capacities. We know the limiting factor many times is mobility. Well, MAPS Performance makes that a priority, but it also makes performance a priority more so than any other MAPS program. If you want to perform, and what I mean is you want to be fast, you want to be strong, you want to be agile, MAPS Performance is the program for you. And for the first time ever, we've taken it and taken the price and cut it in half. Half. It's 50% off all month long, but you have to use the coupon code GREEN50. It's all one word, and it's the number 50. So it's G-R-E-E-N and the number 50 all together, no spaces, at checkout for 50% off at mindpumpmedia.com. We also have bundles at mindpumpmedia.com where we take multiple MAPS programs and put them together for specific goals. For example, we have a super bundle, which is a year of exercise planned out all for you. You can find all of our bundles plus the 50% off MAPS performance with the code GREEN50, all at mindpumpmedia.com. Dude, I'm pissing people off left and right lately. Dude, I got. I did a. I did a. Uh, an Insta story post with this. I got to read this uh, for the podcast because it's pretty. It's actually hilarious. But oh, it's, it's you, true. you're pissing off students. Is that well, you know what on? it is, dude. It's it's when you make a joke that's got a little bit of truth in it. Yeah. That that's it's, when that's you, when it stings. Yeah, yeah some, that's this, when you're piss It's off. moments like this where I feel like we're all the same person. <laughs> well, yeah. Because because it's weird. It's you're I mean, feeling angst right now. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Like we're all like just wanting to remind people that we're an entertainment comedy first and then second yeah. we're fitness and education and information like Yeah. And I, you know the other day and I know it when I do it too. So it's like so active. It's like I think there's part of me that likes to test that every once in a while just to see if w- w- how many snowflakes we have listening to us. <laughs> you know, so I'll say so I I know I used the R word the other day and I I can count on one hand in fucking 850 episodes how many times I've used it. And I thought that the the use of it was I think I I think I called myself it or Justin. I don't even remember how the fuck Someone I, got mad? Probably me. Just one. I did I, you know which is which makes me feel good the size that we're at now. And to only get mm. one person mm. who says that, and it was somebody who was new coming on listening. But I mean, I take the time to explain. I said, "Hey, you know, I, I apologize that you know our our our, our crude language sometimes can be offensive." I said, 
uh, it's it's not meant that I have I have people in my family that have, have that. I also have people close to me that have Down syndrome. So I have a it's not a disrespectful thing. I said it's uh, entertainment, and you know some people can't handle language like that. I totally respect that. I understand that. There's tons of health and fitness podcasts out there that sound like Mister Rogers when you fucking listen to them. I said you know you you can by any means you could go do that, but we're entertainment for that was our our angle when we came into this was we were going to entertain and entertain first mm-hmm. educate second and well so, I, th- I think if you're if you're coming from a, a place of integrity and you're being you know and you have good intentions yeah here's the way i look at it if i have good intentions and i'm coming from a place of integrity and i genuinely am meaning to entertain or i'm genuinely trying to entertain and give you my opinion which is what i do often so sometimes i'll entertain but also give you a serious opinion mm-hmm. and people get angry i'm comfortable with that because it's it's me. What, what I would be uncomfortable with is being misrepresented, mm. right? Like if people get angry with me and say, you're you know, this or that, and I'm like, no, 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 that's not me. That's when I have a problem. But if someone comes to me, like like what I just did, right? Like I just, I posted, a, there's this girl holding this uh, like poster board in front of her face. And it's one of those, I am the 99%, you know, things that they do, right? Yeah. And her thing says, I'm 25 years old with a fine arts degree, no job, no insurance, on food stamps, and twenty thousand dollars in college debt. I am the ninety nine percent. And so then I wrote above it the steps that she went through: go to college, accumulate debt, pick a stupid major, graduate with a useless degree, play victim, and blame society. And it's <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it's funny, it's like but a perfect course, domino. But of course, you offended right everybody yeah. who has that degree. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's a funny. It's funny, right? It's entertaining. It's hilarious. It's also some truth there. You know, yeah, I hate to no, break it to you. There is. And so somebody got angry and they're like, well, you know. So this, I had this lady text, you know, messaged we me. tried like, really hard. No, she's like, that's not a useless degree. I have a fine arts degree and I own a successful business. And I was like, you don't yeah. see the irony in what you just said. You're, right. you're a business owner. Yeah. You're an entrepreneur. That's very different. You can do anything. Yeah. And you're an also entrepreneur. not taking the victim role. Yeah, no, and you're not I'm taking sure the victim role. Right. That's the, the real the message major. is that it's the, I feel sorry yeah. for me because I'm in that, this situation. Yeah. And right. I tried to make the point like, look, you, you, uh, you, you got to do, there's a, there's a bit of a cost analysis. There's a cost, how much it costs to, to get your education versus what the potential benefits are going to come from, right? right? And so the problem is, and I know what the problem is, it's <clears throat> for a long time now we've been fed the line that all education and all degrees are worth whatever they cost. That's been the message. Like it's, no, no, it's totally worth it. Go get a loan for $100,000. You have to have a degree. Uh, wrong. You know, $100,000 liberal arts degree or fine arts degree or, you know, degree in, you know, you know, poetry or whatever, as, as passionate as you may be about those subjects, spending tens of thousands or a hundred thousand dollars on an education for that, it's not a good, it's not a smart decision. There's just, the return is terrible. If you do the math, you look at all the people with those degrees, you look at how many of them actually stayed in the field that they studied, because don't look at the ones that have that degree and then did something else. Look at the ones that actually use that degree, mm-hmm. look at their return how many of them got jobs and how many made money? And you'll see, whoa, that's a shitty. Even, that's a shitty. Even aside from all those details, I feel like every everybody has challenges. It's the victim role that bothers me the yeah, most out yeah. of all that. It's like fuck the fuck the degree part of it, fuck the debt part of it. Yeah. It's the you know feel sorry like feeling feeling to get ourselves out of this. Uh, you, did it, you see that? I just did a just ramped up. I just did a quote. Victim. Was it a day or two ago that life is not a matter of holding good cards, but of playing a poor hand well. Yeah. To me, that's that's what life really is because mm-hmm. everybody is at a disadvantage. Everybody has something that makes it challenging or hard. It doesn't matter. Even the even the most uh, people that start off with the most amount of money, there's challenges to that. You know why? Because you your whole life, if you grow up, I've watched this happen. Like that's why I'm grateful for all the shit that I went through because it forced me to evolve, grow up, and learn the hard way maybe early on, but it's definitely benefited me as I've gotten older because then I see some of my peers who had everything. They had all the opportunity. They would be called what we would say, quote-unquote, white privileged people, but then I see how much they struggle in life. You know why? Because everything was handed to them growing up, so when they hit the real fucking world, they don't know what to do. They didn't have the right training. I had fucking boot camp training since I was a kid that turned me into tough as nails when I hit the real world. That doesn't scare me. The, I think the problem, the part of the problem is people view when you when you say stuff like that, which is 100 percent accurate, 100 percent accurate. You know, here's the bottom line: 
you do not know an individual and their life and their challenges. They could look on the outside like they have everything going for them. Yeah. But they could have mental issues, health issues. They could have bad parents. They could have whatever. It's, it, it, you, you just don't know. But I think what people, the problem is people misconstrue that as a lack of empathy. It's not a lack of empathy. Mm-mm. It's actually, it's, you can be very empathetic. Look, it's like, it's like my kids, okay? It's, you know, uh, it, let's say one of my children had a, a major accident or something terrible happened or a huge challenge. I'm going to be very empathetic towards them. I'm going to, I'm going to love them and I'm going to feel bad and, and, and I don't want them to hurt and I don't want them to be in this situation. But if I really want them to do well, mm-hmm. I'm going to sit down with them and say, look, you know, son or daughter, this terrible thing's happened to you and it's, it's horrible and I feel for you. However, what you choose to do with this is going to dictate how the rest of your life goes. Mm-hmm. You can choose to use this or you can choose to have this just dominate you and destroy you. And that's the key. And so that's kind of what we're saying. And so I have empathy towards people with lots of real challenges that they can't control, things that happen to them. What I don't have empathy for is when people use the victim role in order to uh, dominate others, to use tyranny against others, or... It's the new bully. Or it's it's a way to bully people or just to be able to sit back and be like, yeah, it's my excuse. You know, this is my excuse for not... Here's, a, here's the bottom. This is the wonderful thing about, about free societies. If you are... If you don't have any value to the market, if you're not working, if you're not contributing, you are literally not contributing to society. That's what it really what it is. I and mean, everybody wants everybody to work together. Everybody says we all need to work together. And I agree, we do. But if you're sitting at home and you're not doing shit and you're not contributing, you are a drag. And so you need to figure out a way to contribute, to help, to work, and to build your self-confidence and to do all these things. And again, I have empathy for people right. in challenging situations. But I've seen firsthand people in some of the most challenging situations you could ever imagine use those situations and become, I mean, in, just become, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, uh, role models yeah. for the rest of us. Some of the most successful people you could ever think about. And, you know, Adam uses himself as an example. For all intents and purposes, boy, you had about a million and one reasons that you could have sat back and be like, you know, poor me. Oh, I deserve better. Yeah. Well, every, everybody, you know, gets handed a, a a deck of cards that, you know, they just don't have any control over that, you know, whatever that looks like for every individual. And, you know, of course, like, like we all have this, this empathy towards people that are in this tough situation. I mean, that's just a natural human instinct is to, is to want to be able to help, you know, your neighbor or help somebody out of trouble. But it, it inevitably, it amounts to how that person is able to, you know, internalize this and, and really try to improve themselves. Like if they're not going to take ownership of that process and try and help themselves, you can only do so much as an outside person trying to lift somebody up. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's dead. It's dead weight. Like it, it's not going to go anywhere. It Listen, life without fucking obstacles would be boring as shit. Well, there'd be no growth. There would be no growth, okay? It would be, and it would be boring as shit. Think about that. Think about if if everything you did just it happened easy for you and and it went your way and it was never challenging. How lame would life be? I, we would all stay the same. And and here's the other thing too. Look, if it was just a matter of giving people more of basic necessities, giving people more money, more prosperity, we would not see the explosion of depression, anxiety, and suicides. That we're currently seeing. I mean, it, this is, it's a fact that today we live in the most prosperous times in all of human history. All of human history, right? The, 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 the 20th and 21st century, 20th century saw just this explosion yeah, of be, prosperity. Yeah, because we, we're not worried about getting attacked by lions. We can, we can stress about bullshit, about not getting paid more money or stuff like that. Well, right? I think people just, I think we, we, we get what we want and then we realize it's not you know what's going to give well, we react is- before we really like think about it you yeah. know like it's a lot of times it's this knee jerk reaction of like here's what i'm sp- here's how i'm supposed to feel and it's like really do you really feel that way or well, is this just like a quick reaction look, i'll take it all the way back to something simple because i think when we talk about life it's complicated and then people will debate all these different scenarios and we get lost in the weeds i like to use fitness as a as a an example because fitness is quite black and white okay so Let's say you're a trainer or you're a gym owner or you're just a fitness enthusiast. And if you're listening to this podcast, the odds are you're probably one of those things, right? And somebody comes to you and goes, oh, you know, I grew up, all we ever ate was boxed packaged food. All I had was potato chips for dinner. 
you know, this is just the way I grew up. It was terrible. That's all I know how to eat. I don't have access to a gym and I'm a hundred pounds overweight and there's nothing that can be done. Now, a fitness enthusiast would be like, no, there's a lot you can do. There's a lot. Start walking. Let's start walking. Let's start watching what you eat. And the person just says, no, man, like everybody's against me. Society's against me. Yeah, most- Processed food is everywhere. It tastes really good. You know, engineers make the food to taste good. Yeah. And I'm my destined job, to fail. My job is sedentary. Like, no, I, it, you know, everything's designed for me to be overweight. And that's just the world that we live in. And you're saying, no, no, there's things you can do. And they don't want to do it because they want to be sad and play the victim role. Now, that's quite easy for us to see. The, the, the folly in that. It's really easy for us to look at that and be like, well, expand that. This is one of the reasons why I love fitness so much is yeah. I would take people, especially kids. I used to love training kids because I would take kids and they would learn this lesson through fitness. I wouldn't even have to say anything. They'd come in, they'd work hard, they'd get stronger. Next thing you know, they're up, their schoolwork is getting better. Next thing you know, they want to get a job. Next thing you know, they're more responsible around the house. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. Because they've learned this lesson that, oh, if I work and I have, there's things that I can control and things I can't, I'm going to focus on things I can. Here's what I can do. And I've trained. Listen, well, I've it's trained. the most important kind of work because you're working on yourself. And I think that we we totally get away from that. But just by showing up to school, by showing up to your job, by doing all these things like outside of, of, of yourself, like where you're not really paying attention to how you interact, how you think and how you like build yourself up and improve every day. Yeah, I've. Um, do you think we're getting worse or do you think we're getting better? Like, do you think like I think the victim, the victimhood uh, mentality is growing because yeah. it's hitting it's hitting its peak right now. Because we're more prosperous, so uh, because we just you can you can sit back and do that. I love it when people use their, for example, you know, it's not a uh, it's not a secret that I'm, you know, pro freedom and pro free markets, right? And I'll have people will will message me on their technology on their iPhones from their mom's house and say things like, "Oh, if we just had socialism." It's like you don't realize the irony of what you the device that you're using, right? I think we're living in a time where it allows for a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I also think it doesn't help that politician. And here's the thing about that's why I love and hate politics so much. I love it cuz it's fascinating. I hate it because of the way they manipulate people so much. Politicians are experts at manipulating the masses. This is what they do, and they spend a lot of money doing it. The last presidential election was over a billion dollars. The next one will be more expensive than that. It always goes up in cost. And the money that they spend is about manipulating us to get right. them to, to get us to vote a particular way and telling us that we're victims and telling us that they have the answers is a very, very safe and successful formula. It's yeah. worked for a long time. It's easy for them to say, the reason why you don't have a job is because of you know, Mexicans. The reason why you don't have, uh, you know, this is because of uh, trade, uh, you know, uh, globalism and trade. The reason why you don't have this is because minimum wage laws are mm-hmm. not the way they should be or because big business, whatever. And they'll, and, and they'll say, but we have the solution, right? And so now you feel like you're a victim and you vote for these people. And meanwhile, they're stirring up this crazy victimhood mentality where yeah. it's absolutely to the point now where it's, it's hilarious. I'm watching movements destroy themselves because of this victimhood <laughs> mentality. Right. It's really, I actually. Well, because there's no line. Dude. There's no line. It's like you go all the way to the extreme, but now it's like it, it, it like cannibalizes itself. Like once it gets to that extreme, it's crazy because they start creating even more standards and more people that are, you know, excluded that they have to like highlight. That's just interesting. Dude, okay. Wasn't there something like recently? Uh, oh, I, I don't know if I'm going to bring this up. It was, it was something about another thing about pedophilia and like trying to like uh, put that to, to light as being like more of a mental issue that we should really support and not like you know condemn what yeah that's weird yeah it was, it was really some weird. fucked up thing that i saw and i was just like i can't accept this like no. i can't like you can't put that kind of thing out there and like me just be like oh yeah okay like yeah, yeah you know let's let's figure this out yeah and you know, i don't like, I, no you're a piece of shit yeah and, and be honest <laughs> that's it yeah and be open and honest about it and have this this uh, this you know this discourse there was i actually saw a chart it was a privilege hierarchy okay so like, oh great, yeah. So like, uh, <laughs> a, like a like a a gay white man has more privilege than a gay white woman has more privilege than a gay black woman, and then it went to this whole thing where right. it, they were like ranking who's more privileged than who because, and they were just literally this brings me back putting to- people in boxes, and I'm like based off of That's you hilarious. know like your skin color. This brings me back crazy. to my first point though. Is like. 
you know, what's funny is we, we, we get in these big debates about privilege and it's like, is being privileged an advantage? Hmm. I, I could debate the other side. Yeah. I, I don't I don't believe you I see mean, a lot of dysfunction in that, you know, with the kids. That what, grow when, up when, that. when 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 uh, money is all that uh, we all look at, like you talked about the other day, Sal, like if you're not if you don't worship God or believe in God, then there's something else that we worship. And if you worship money and you think money and success and getting to a certain place in, in, a, in a company is your mm-hmm. your end all be all, then mm-hmm. maybe privilege does matter. But what we come to find out when people get to these levels, how many of them are unhappy? Yeah, how many actors suicide. and actresses and, and mm-hmm. athletes that had millions of dollars and are up in this, this living in this, the amongst the most privileged are the most unhappy and unfulfilled. Mm-hmm. So is it really a privilege to be privileged? Maybe it's not. Maybe being disadvantaged is actually more an advantage. Like, oh, th- think on that for a fucking minute. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's so hilarious that we sit here and we talk about all that they, shit. Like, they just did a study on uh, trigger warnings. You guys know what trigger warnings are. Right. They do in college. Like, trigger warning, we're about to talk about an old book that whatever. They did a study. I think it was Harvard that did the study and found that it actually is harming students. Duh. Yeah. Right? It's actually harming students to do this because it's causing them to become uh, less... Or more, what's the word, sensitive and afraid of, well, basically the real world. It's and, fear, man. Yeah. Like, like the, don't we realize that fear is the the thing that, like, always will allow somebody to govern over us and, like, keep us down? Like, mm. fear is, is the tactic they've always used to oppress us. Yeah, it says that trigger warnings may coddle the mind and actually increase the risk of some of these kids getting, you know bad effects from seeing things that they don't like you know what i'm saying yeah which is kind of i mean it makes sense right that's that's totally what makes sense so well i was surprised when we the first time that we talked about the cry closets i was actually surprised of the forum you know we had we definitely had a, a handful of people yeah, that, some people supporting it for that, sure. that came back and supported that and i thought wow that's that's pretty crazy to me i thought that would be like one of those things if you were a mind pump listener you would think how ridiculous that really is, but there was a lot of people that came well, forward. Well, like I said, there's empathy. There, I understand the empathetic aspect. I'm a very empathetic person, you know, but, you know, here's the deal. Like, if you're an adult and you're in a challenging situation, you're at work and your boss is like, I need this report. Listen, you know, we got a new deadline, needs to be done tonight. That means you got to work until it's finished. And the adult's looking at them and the adult knows, like, oh man, I had a dinner planned tonight with my wife and so the employee looks at the boss and just starts crying right imagine that situation just breaks down and starts crying yeah okay yeah i get that you're sad i get that you know i should feel empathetic but at the same time you are an ineffective human being at that moment if you want to go to dinner with your wife you sit down and you have a conversation with your boss if you don't then you stay at work and you bust your ass sitting there crying makes you an ineffective human being in that situation i have empathy for you but there's definitely times when you got to, you know, what do they say? Put your big, you know, big boy or big girl pants well, on. They say man up, but I'm sure you can't say that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, we, we know what that, yeah, we, know like, what that ugh, yeah, we know toxic. what that means. Sometimes you just got to say, oh, fuck, all right, let's get this shit done. Because that's, that's how you're effective. It doesn't mean you're not empathetic. It just means that's how life kind of works and what makes you effective. I can't imagine world leaders acting like that. You imagine? Being yeah. a, a world leader and right. like you know crying to another person because you're, you're you're negotiating a trade agreement or something like that well, and it's not why, fair and yeah I just I guess for me I just see society like like being tough is a lost trait like just the the idea of being resilient and uh, you know having this kind of character where you're just like I mean you're fucking tough like it's really hard to get at you. You know, like that, that is just not something I see people really lifting out there, like, and putting out there as like something to like, and being stoic. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's something that people like they like everybody has to be so fucking sensitive and cry all the time. And like, like, like share every shit thing that happened to them. Like, like, (laughs) I don't know. It's just different. It's a different thing now. Some things you need to be able to say to yourself, like, okay, that's ridiculous. I don't need to be upset over that. Tough, tough your way out of it. uh, the, The definition of faith that resonates for me along those lines is like you do everything you can to, to get what you think you want, but then you have faith that whatever happens is supposed to happen that way. That's my understanding of it. And so I think when you're in a tough situation, being tough basically means like having faith. And I don't care if this means you believe in God or whatever, or maybe have faith in your own abilities or faith that, you know, you can handle whatever comes your way at the end of it didn't work out the way I wanted 
I'm crushed, I'm devastated, I'm sad, but I have faith, and so I'm going to be tough. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Right. Rather yeah. than be defeated. Or understanding that there's a silver lining in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That there, there's a lesson to be learned in that and that maybe I needed to learn. And that's, boy, is that hard for people to mm-hmm. understand. Like, it's just so hard when you're in the middle of this. This hurts. It's painful. This Why did this happen to me? Like, being able to pull yourself away and be like, okay, well, where where is the message for me in this? Or where is the silver lining for, for me to be able to grow and level it's, up from it's this? It's an attitude that if you're... If you're trying to get to a point in your life where you're, you know, healthy and fit um, and content and fulfilled, that attitude will take you very far. Even like I said, if we if we bring it all the way back down to the very basic, get lean, build muscle, be fit. Let's just look at that for a second. Yeah. Having that attitude of, okay, my life is busy. You know, maybe you're a single parent. Maybe you have two jobs. You don't have a lot of money to spend on on gym. You know, access. Maybe it's hard to eat right because your schedule, but you still say, okay, here's the cards I've been dealt. Here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to organize things. I'm going to work towards, you would, you would be surprised at how capable we are when we have that attitude. I mean, humans have done incredible things and it's all come from that attitude. And basically what I'm trying to communicate is that is a very useful attitude to have. It's going to serve you well. It doesn't mean you don't have empathy. Doesn't mean you don't feel bad when something bad happens. Doesn't mean you don't want to help other people. Because I definitely believe very strongly in charity. I believe very, very strongly in helping your fellow man. I have I feel I feel very strongly in my empathy. But at the same time, you have to have that attitude for yourself because that's what's gonna that's what's gonna help you. The well, other you, attitude doesn't. You know what I've been thinking about, and uh, I I kind of attribute it to like the you know sort of the workforce that's out there now. Like what what are people doing in their jobs? Like People, people really don't have anything to do. Like even, even when they're at the job, they're on the clock. They're looking at Facebook. They're looking at Twitter. There's just, I, I feel like there, there's a sense of like, we're just not, we're, we're not fulfilling some kind of purpose or like, you know, in, in my job or I'm not finding this, I'm not driven enough. And so it's like, there's, there's people just aren't busy enough, mm. you know, like a, you're, you're not like waking up every day to accomplish things. It's like, you know, like, so. Cause you don't have to anymore. It's different. Mm. You don't have to anymore. I think we're super busy, but not busy with. Not, not like the purposeful things. Yeah. 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 I think we're super, super busy. I saw a study on this one time. I wish I knew what it was. I, Doug, maybe you can search for something like that. It had something to do with the amount of hours of productivity that a, a, an average employee saw a, that. actually has. Yeah. And it was it, it's embarrassing. Cr- yeah. It's like out of an eight hour day, like it's like two hours is like actual mm-hmm. like work time. The rest is like, which is great. I love it. Cause I, I, I imagine sad. a lot of you guys listen to us, uh, as you're working right now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, but it's like, yeah. You know, like there's a lot of jobs out there where you really could just skate and then like look like you're 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 working and make sure you look busy, uh, but really it's well, this, it's this is also lot to this do. is also too though this goes back to the beginning of a topic of like the uh, you know entertain but yet educate at the same time too was a, a main mission I think of Mind Pump it wasn't just about you know us purely entertaining it's not I hope it's not just that for I mean at least the feedback that I've gotten since we've started this show is that. It's rare that you listen to an episode and there's not a takeaway in there mm-hmm. for you as an individual, whether it be personal growth wise or it has something to do with business or it has something to do with health and fitness, which is what we're surrounded around, right? Yeah, um, you, that was it's just an effect. Oh, it was. It was two hours. Yeah, two hours it. and 53 minutes of productivity <laughs> through an eight hour day. <laughs> the whole day. That's two crazy. hours. You know, that is crazy. It, it makes, makes sense, though. Yeah. What a, God, what well, a, this is where now that now it's in uh, you see companies like. Um, the Facebooks and the Googles and like uh, some of these other companies that are starting to do this now where they have, you know, these short spurts of work and then they break it up with fun and events and playing and doing things That's like that. That's smart. It is smart. It's very smart. If I mean, because if you're an employer and you look and you go like, oh, shit, on average, the average employee is only giving me two hours and 53 minutes. Mm-hmm. I'm paying them from nine to five. I may as well enhance that experience and maybe I can squeeze out an extra 10 or 15 minutes. They're already fucking playing on the clock and not mm-hmm. doing shit. Mm-hmm. I may as well organize it so hopefully I can get more productivity out of them. So that's really interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting strategy. I, I like that. I like that. And tech companies are the ones that do it because it's such a com- competitive field because mm-hmm. they're actually, they're literally fighting for employees it's such a competitive field and they're trying to figure out ways of making it more 
productive, but also making it a, 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 a you know lucrative to people in many different areas. This is why you go to like again, you brought up Google. Have, I mean, you guys know all the free shit people get at Google, oh, yeah. Yeah. like free massages and food and well, they want to keep know, everybody on laundry. campus, which is smart, you know, because it's like the longer you stay there, the more likely you're gonna squeeze a couple extra yeah. minutes out of work, and you'll <laughs> network with people that are working on projects and things will kind of. Spark. It's extremely competitive, which is a yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah, that's well, that's what it is. It's, you know, Google's competing with you know YouTube and Apple and. All these companies are fighting for for similar talent, so they're trying to attract as many people as they can. So, anyway. you know, you yeah. bought stock the other day. Is it still? Are they, is Facebook it, went back up. Did it go back up? Yeah, mm. yeah, I did. I, you know, I think it's a long it's a long buy because I think Facebook. What makes me like Facebook is just the sheer number of people and the sheer number of uh, per, like amount of information. Oh, it's not going away. No, yeah, no, no. <laughs> they, they already have too much, and then they own Instagram on top of it. So, which right. I see, I see them uh, moving in that. I mean, that if it wasn't for Instagram, I mean, they they've really, really picked up on that. I think he, I forgot the number. I saw what, what he bought it at and what it's worth now. It's like. Yeah, they also own WhatsApp, which that was a big... Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that was a big purchase a while back, like a couple years ago. Well, dude, here's the thing that's kind of crazy, though, about the social media platforms right now. So you guys, do you guys know who Alex Jones is? Yeah. Do you know who he is? The yeah. InfoWars guy, yeah, the conspiracy the, theorist yeah, yeah. and whatever. So he got kicked off all platforms, all of them. Social, uh, uh, he's not on Twitter, not on Facebook, and now YouTube what? kicked him off. And they said it's because it's the globalists. Well, and what they said it's is they said it's because he has uh, hate speech, and they want to remove hate speech. Now, here's the deal: those are private companies, so it's it's a hundred percent within the rights to kick off whoever the hell they want off their platform. So I'm not saying you know we should force them to change anything, but I do find it weird mm. that Alex Jones gets kicked off, but you have Antifa, who's the who you know. Call, these guys are basically domestic terrorists. Mm-hmm. Um, you had that one journalist that just got a job at the New York, I think it's the New York Times, I, I believe, maybe New York Post. Maybe you can find it for me, Doug. She's an Asian journalist, and she has a string of tweets that she wrote a while ago saying horrible things about white people, like horrible things about white people. Very, very racist. Hmm. Her stuff never got pulled off. She's still there. And so the inconsistency with what they consider hate speech and whatever – yeah. Is a little bit alarming, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Oh. Mainly because they're so powerful. They're such powerful platforms, right? That uh, I don't know. It's fascinating, I man. What do you guys think about yeah, this? Well, you can see how it, it completely just has to be within their definition, their narrative of what that is, right? There's no like democracy in that. Like you're you're either on our platform or abiding by yep. you know our stands or not. So. Well, uh, Candace, the reality. Do you guys it. know what Candace Owens is? No, she's this like conservative, uh, you know, black woman, right? Very, very, uh, very intelligent, very good on. on oh media. yeah, no, no, I follow her. Very, very uh, intelligent on media, um, and she's just she's on the other side, and I like I like watching both sides. So I'll see the extreme liberal, extreme conservative, and I tend to agree half the time with each of them. But anyway, what Candace Owens did, which I thought was brilliant, is she took the exact tweets that this woman made, this this writer, uh-huh. about white people, and she changed the word white with black or Jewish just as an experiment. So wow. same statement. Wow. Just changed the word white to black or Jewish, and she got suspended on Twitter for saying the exact same thing but just saying it about black people or Jewish people. Oh wow! Yeah. How crazy is that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a it's a, it's kind of you can shit all over white people. It's it's it's, it's free like reign. open season. Yeah, it's free reign. <laughs> yeah. I know. I don't like that. I hate it's, inconsistencies. You know, I think it's all shitty. Well, I, I think know? I it think it, I also think it's be- because fifty years ago it wasn't like that, and so we, we're sure. we're seeing it, it swing this way. And in order to get it to swing this way, it's a lot of pent up energy in that yeah, direction. Yeah, right. And just like a pendulum, like it was meant to swing back into the center, and it's got momentum now, and it's swinging way it's hard just, the other yeah. direction. I, have, I just, just have slamming hard. Yeah, it's yeah. soon, soon everybody that's and I feel like that's this is why Trump got where he's at. This is because and as much as there's people that hate him and whatever like that, is that he's the extreme the other direction. He's the one trying to push the pendulum yeah. the other way and i i you know i it, it all it's always that way with presidents right it's yeah. we, we go one side to the other side back and forth yeah, back and forth and back congress and flips also you'll get right like, yeah, yeah. I, I just hate uh i hate inconsistencies and, and like lack of logic i really really yes. it just irks me it's like let's just be consistent like don't say shit don't say racist shit about anybody 
don't like say it's okay about this one race and it's not okay about this race and let's not say shit about men and women instead of the you know oh it's okay to say it about you know just men or yeah. it's just okay to say it about these well, religions and not that religion yeah, well, what, it's what, still what, divisive it's so, it's well, so illogical if you want to be inclusive let's conclude everybody well, yeah. what i mean what happened to free speech i mean it, say what i don't give a fuck yeah. say whatever you want to say and the and if oh, it's still free and it's, if there's a bunch of people that follow you then they're a bunch of bigots too right. and then the, you, we can keep them all in the category like there's yeah. a yeah. there's are all the oh, biggest I see what on. you said there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and if you Peace don't, out. if you don't like what they have to say, then don't consume their content. Yeah. You know, right. it's like if it's not for you, then don't do it. It's just like the how I offended the girl the other day. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I've, I'm sorry that a, a single adjective is is enough for you to decide who I am as a person. That's unfortunate. And okay, but I respect it that you have the you have an opinion. You have every every right to say what you said to me, and you have every right to not listen to the show because of that. I hope that I attract people that have a little bit thicker skin and are a bunch of fucking snowflakes. That's mm-hmm. all. I hope that's who I get. That's who. That's the, the people. That, and I know damn well there's people that listen to the show that don't care for me that much, but love the way Sal presents himself and loves the way that ju- that's fine. I'm okay with that. Like that's. So I, I nobody nobody hates Justin. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah right. <laughs> right. I got. I think know. I just think literally that, nobody. I don't I, think that no, it needs to be policed. Like I don't need. We don't need to police it. No, we, and that's and it is free speech. It's just it's a, because they're private organizations and they and a, you know like Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and you know Instagram. They're private and so they can kick you off if if they wanted to. They could kick every Republican off their platforms or every Democrat, well, so, and it's a, totally up to them. <clears> we're, and, and, I, and it's not a problem. I mean, I have, I have a problem. With I have a, I have something I follow a lot, and I'm I'm a little annoyed by it. And, and I don't I don't bitch about it. I don't complain. It's just I'll just stop reading their material. I love complex news, but complex in the last year, especially since Trump has been in office, is has shown they are. There's like super hardcore left. And they're uh, they they were really cool on pop culture. I love their little news on even sports. They cover a lot of topics that I enjoy to read, and I just don't care so much that they the slant that they have right now on all their political stuff that they keep doing. It's like I feel like a lot of it is really naive the shit that they put out there. But I'm not somebody who gets on there and makes and fucking waste my time arguing it and debating it. It's just like okay, I'll just tune it out. Like there's, I'm not there for that now. I'll, I'll take their sneaker advice. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like right. I'm not going to read their fucking political views because I think they're stupid. It's you getting, know? it's getting. It feels like it's getting a little polarized. It's funny when when Americans are polled across the board. Most Americans are in the middle. Most yeah. Americans are not. It feels like they're they we're being super polarized. Yeah. But really, we're most people are in the middle. Most Americans are pro free market and pro uh, like pro freedom socially. So it's like most Americans support things like gay marriage, you know, loosening drug laws or 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 ending the war on drugs. Uh, most Americans are pro you know, allowing more immigrants to come into the country. Most Americans are also pro free market, anti super high taxes, high, high regulations. We're stuck with this two party system bullshit. Yeah. So most people are kind of in the middle and that's kind of tend to where I sit. Right. Which is why I can, I piss off everybody. It's it's funny when, when, when Bush was the, the president, it, you, if you heard me, you'd think I was like this hardcore liberal. It's just I hated – Bush was just represented all the shitty sides of the right. When Obama was in, everybody thought I was super right. Now Trump's in and I'm – you know, there's a lot of things I don't like about him either. But most people are, are somewhere in the middle – they don't really have a voice, unfortunately. The, vo- the voices that tend to get heard yeah. the most are the Rational extreme. people, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. Actually, we had this debate in the forum, and someone was saying how, uh, how, de- how polarized it seems. And I thought about it for a second, and then I, you know, I, I, I tried to view it in the context of uh, you know, recent, relatively recent American history. Man, the 60s and 70s were way worse. I don't think we're anywhere near as bad as the 60s and 70s in terms of polarization. Mm. That was a very, very volatile time. You had civil rights leaders getting assassinated left and right. You had presidents getting assassinated. You had a war that was extremely unpopular. You had a counterculture that that the CIA actually viewed as a threat to national security. I don't. We're nowhere near as bad as that. So I, I you know, and that's the other thing too. I think uh, social media is just it just takes the good and the bad of media and it, it amplifies it. And one of the bad things it amplifies is 
the spreading of bad news. Mm-hmm. And it, I think people think things are a lot worse than they are. Oh, we're car wreck chasers. Yeah, and it's not as bad. It's not nearly as bad as we think it is. It really isn't. It's, yeah. it's good we have these conversations, but most well, people... Well, you talked about that already. We live in a, a safer, more prosperous time in our lives ev- than ever, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So it's, But yet, I, th- I feel like we see more complaints, more highlights. It feels like that way. Right. And I feel like like now too, we're we're really like actively trying to consider everybody's point of view. You know, it's tough. It's like, there's so many different types of people that all coexist here in the same place and they all have different agendas. And so like, how do you manage all of that? It's really tough. That's the thing about America. That's, that's, I love more than anything. It's uh, one of the most, arguably maybe the most diverse country in the world it's a new country if you compare it to you know europe and asia and eastern europe it's a very new country in comparison but it's extremely diverse it's made up of so many different people so many different religions so many different belief systems that uh it it encourages things like innovation it encourages things like progress um but it also causes there's also lots of arguing and fighting so it's like when you look at like I love people that use the Scandinavian countries as examples. Like, look how happy people are. Everybody there agrees on the same shit. Yeah. Everybody there, they're all the same race. They're all the same, yeah, yeah race, yeah. same color, yeah, like everything. Most people are same religion. Is you know, it's not nearly as diverse. I mean, it's definitely got some diversity. It's a free country. It's a very free country with very free markets, but it's not nearly as diverse as a country like ours where we just have all kinds of shit going on all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a communist party in America, that, you know, socialist communist party that still has <laughs> members, right? Yeah. You know, and if in, in, in a country that, you know, made capitalism popular or whatever. So we have all these different views and we fight and we bicker and we argue, but we innovate and we progress very, very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't that long ago at all. It was like, you know, decades ago yeah. that... You know, we had segregation and now, you know, decades later, it wasn't, we're not talking about hundreds of years. We're talking about decades later, we had a black president. That's incredible progress, not where we need to be, but incredible progress Mm -hmm. from where we were. So I think when we look at things through that lens, you know, it's like, okay, we can argue, we can fight, you know, we could beat each other's throats, but at the end of the day, we end up finding a way of, 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 of you know, innovating, working together, and progressing. It's so. kind of crazy that fitness yeah. is kind of like a microcosm of all of this, right? Mm. Sure. When you think about it, and I really feel like that's a lot of what we represent is to, to break down all those walls and barriers and all these different, like, camps, mm. you know? It's like there's there's so much great in all of it. It's not you, they're wrong and you're right or I'm right, they're wrong. It's not like that at all. It's like, yeah, there's... There's a good message within all that. There's something that somebody can take away from all of these different camps, and we should be one big camp that we that everybody has the ability to pull from instead of trying to divide all of us and debate semantics. That's why it drives me crazy when people hang on one or two little things that's something that you might have said or a view that you have with how to get in shape or a way to do nutrition and it's just like oh no that's not right yeah. the science supports this and says it's supposed to be that like get the fuck out of here there's so many there's there's such an individual variance to so many people that you might be right in this one scenario i might be right in another scenario at the end of the day both people could be right it's not a matter that of was that. the biggest learning lesson i had as a trainer right. was like like realizing that cuz i can't tell you Sure, a majority of my clients, you know, would respond and react and to nutrition and exercise like the studies showed they would. But there was a sizable minority. It wasn't like two people. It was a sizable minority that would break all the rules. You know, we do shit and I'd be I would be dumbfounded. Like, why is this person not responding to what we're doing? Or why is this this person says they're only eating thirteen hundred calories? but they're still overweight. I used to think people were lying to me, you know? Right. Or, you know, I've had clients where I was like, no, no, you need to eat meat because if you don't eat meat, you're probably lacking nutrients and they're just thriving on a vegan diet. And so I had to like step, take a step back and be like, okay, like there's, a, there's, there's more to this than what the studies will show. Mm-hmm. And that's when I became a really good trainer is when I started looking, people, looking at people more as individuals rather than, you know, the, the, you know, I have this general framework that I enter in with, but I'm okay with breaking the rules and, that was a huge learning lesson for me, at least. Huge, yeah. huge learning lesson. So. I, did, you, did you see the the post that uh, the I think I shared on the forum for everyone to try and get on there was the the vegan guy, the vegan bodybuilder that was put out there on the podcast uh, who he should have on the podcast, and I told the forum to go over there if they could have a chance to drop by. And we must have had, I don't know, 50 to 60 people get over there and 
not one. Yeah, did he res- ever respond? Did he didn't respond. It looked like he responded to everybody else <laughs> except for <laughs> all the mind pump ones. I'm like, maybe it's because I'm doing the carnivore diet. That's so. Yeah, it's too. Like, it's too bad. You yeah. know. Well, I, I don't know if either one of you looked at his page and everything, and and he's just. I've seen him before. He's just so hardcore. Hard, I mean, his girl's got vegan tattooed on her butt, mm. and they're wow. they they push the vegan message so hard, and it's just. I don't know. I feel like it becomes so religious when people when people treat it that way. It's like I'm not. Well, it is. It is a belief system for them. Yeah, it is. When it's, you're, when you're, and here's a here's the thing about nutrition, by the way. When nutrition becomes a belief system, you are very consistent, but you also become very uh, fanatical about it. And for a vegan, for the most consistent vegan, the most consistent vegans are the people that truly believe in their heart. Right. It is immoral and wrong. To kill animals for pretty much for any reason, right. okay. To killing yeah. it's just immoral, and so they 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 you know like the value hierarchy system. Their values that's one of their top values, and so for them they're evangelizing mm-hmm. when they're talking about veganism. It's not just about health and it's healthier, and they're not just making arguments that it's better for you. They're driven by the fact that they're trying to save animals, and so through that lens of trying to save animals because it's immoral. That's what drives all their arguments, and that's why it can come across, and it is in many cases. Right. Well, that's fanatical and dogmatic. They're trying to end like cruelty, you know, and I get that, and like it is a very strong, you know, like belief system. I mean, it's the same. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I should bring up abortion, but it's like you know, you, <laughs> the two. you know, you start getting yeah, into that third rail today. Yeah, right. We're just might as well go there, right? Uh, but but that's why people get so passionate about it because it's it's a belief system. It's like yeah right. Like, no, this is this is a life, you know. And so you go to those levels where it's like you're not going to convince them otherwise. So it's like okay, well, you know, I don't I don't no, really know where to go with this. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's uh, it's it's there. It's a it's there. It's what they truly believe, and so trying to convince them otherwise is impossible. But yeah, again, like the vegans are trying to. Uh, vegans in this category are trying to make the case because they want to save animals, not because veganism is Which we've healthier. all said we're okay with that, right? Totally. I mean, yeah, if that's in your I belief res- system, I respect you. Totally, you know, fine. totally. I just don't like it when they use that then to make the case that it's better for yeah. everybody. That it's healthier yeah, yeah. for most people or that- Or that we were intended to be that way. Yeah. Or that you're bad. Because now you're manipulating data and information just to serve your narrative. Yeah, because that's not that's just that's just not true. Which is just as bad as somebody some of these religious dogmatic people that do the same thing too. Yeah. You yeah. start manipulating information just to, to, just to serve you and serve your message, right? That's right. That's right. And you know, so yeah, I would love to get on his podcast and talk to him because I have met a couple vegan bodybuilders that were quite- quite shocking at how well they felt and the muscle they built and how awesome they felt. And so it'd be interesting to have that conversation mm-hmm. about that. But, um, you know, and then we can of course debate, you know, the health, like what's actually healthier, forget right. the individual variants, but for most people, what's actually healthier, what actually works better for most people. It's unfortunate that someone like that won't though, you know, it's like, they well, might, you no. never know. No. You don't think I don't so? Know. No. Yeah. I, I like don't, I said, it's a belief system. I don't, it's hard think, to crack. I don't think that it's weird at all that he responded to everybody else but anybody that tagged Mind Pump. Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty pretty obvious that he wouldn't want to have a, a conversation around that, which that's the other thing, too. And I actually saw some other people on other – You know, I went through his page first because I thought, okay, would this be even worth a he's conversation? Yeah, a nice-looking page. No, he does, and I thought that it would be a great conversation. I said, And he's got a lot of influence. I think he's got like a quarter million people that are following him, and – you know the message that he's giving. I would just like to. I would like to have him expand on some of his thoughts, and and then us maybe challenge some of the way he's thinking on different things, and have a great discussion. And I think that uh, we have the right platform I would, to do I, it. I just wish I, I would love a vegan to make uh, an ar- make a different argument. Like if I was a vegan, I think I could make a much better argument than the vegan arguments that I've heard. Because I hate it when vegans present the argument and say. No, this is just a healthier way to eat, and this is how we're supposed to eat. And it's, no, 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 that's not true. If 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 we were, you know, hunter gatherers, and you just tried to survive off of the plants and stuff that grow around you, you fucked. Yeah, you'd be in trouble. You'd you'd be in, the reason why you. And so I would I, the way I would position the argument is like, look, we live in modern times. Mm-hmm. We can get creative with 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 plant you know, uh, t- based foods. So I can get all the nutrients I need. I can combine foods. And because of the fact that now I can get food from Mexico and food from right. you can get other seasonable food that, you know, normally you'd have to wait. Yes. Know. And here's why I think it's better because, and then I'd make those points 
and I'd make the real points that you can you know start to argue. That would be a better argument. I don't like it when they try and use the the false arguments because then it's like okay, well you're, you're not you're gonna and have when a it's tough just time. misinformation. Like, yeah, like, like, like what the health? Like the yeah, cow, I hear like, cows are killing the ozone. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, <laughs> the, the, just, the methane gas. Yeah, well, it no. turns people off because it's just misinformation. That's like a tenth yeah. of what oil and gas are yeah. really doing. You know what the or- you know what the irony is? <laughs> Fossil fuels. Is the, yeah. the irony of that is too is um you know with uh, cows and chickens and pigs and all that stuff. And the irony is if if they weren't domesticated animals for food, they probably they probably would not exist at nearly the not even close to the population they do now. Like one of the ways you want to guarantee an animal, if you want to guarantee that an animal doesn't go extinct. Then have people uh, own them and eat them. You'll for sure they'll never go. They'll all have plenty of cows because we eat beef, right? Right. If we didn't, if we didn't have milk and and and, and beef, how many like wild cows or you know, you know it wouldn't be that much. And then of course the flip flip argument could be well that's not really a life and why would they, you know they grew up in captivity and all that stuff. So, but yeah, it would be an interesting it would be an interesting conversation. No, no, yeah, it, it would be. be. Yeah. I see you moving your shoulder. Funny, what's going Fuck, on, dude? I you know. God, we're getting old, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, is the, that natural life? The worst. Thing, <laughs> yeah, it's, like, oh, it's harder, bro. Oh, it's harder when you're natural, bro. <laughs> like, like the steroids. Actually, actually, you hurt yourself again. To be honest, that, that's actually not true. The the anabolics would make a situation like this even worse. In fact, this used to happen a lot to me because of that. Because you build muscle so fast and so push rat- it too hard. Yeah, push it too hard, and then you get out out of balance for sure. So I would actually deal with more of this stuff. Uh, when I was on than when I'm off. But on a real note, I know exactly what, I mean, I, I stretched myself right now. Of course, I'm slowly increasing volume week over week. And I knew that this last back session that I did, I knew I was stretching myself and pushing it. And so I knew I was going to be more sore than usual. And so my back is definitely tight. And yesterday, I just so happened to make that the day too, that I sat down in front of my computer for like five hours straight and, you know, shoulders rolled forward and I'm sitting there you know, looking at not little tiny numbers all day. So I'm on this rounded posture. I know that. Cause, and then as soon as I like moved from that, after I'd been stuck there for a frozen Inflamed. frame, oh, just instantly I could feel the pain in my shoulder and it just, oh, it was driving me crazy. And then last night Katrina was, normally Katrina opens me up and works on me a little bit when that stuff like that happens. And I didn't have her last night uh, to do that. And fuck, dude, I'm just feeling, it's just annoying right now because I know it just, it needs to be worked out. And he's, and I got on the, I got on the ball or the. Is it in the shoulder blade or in the shoulder itself? Well, the, the pain feels like it's in the shoulder, but I know it's, it's related to my, my back, my shoulder blade, right? It's related to me being tight and then rolling my shoulder forward and, and typing on the computer all day. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just out of alignment right there. And I know if I realign it, I open up and I start to relax. Yeah. What were the exercises and stuff that you were just going too heavy for too hard? I, I did some heavy deadlift. It's just the total volume too. Mm-hmm. Just a lot of work on, on my back. So I did heavy deadlifting. I did pull-ups. I did uh, rows and what I think I did lap pull down. Oh, yeah, all kinds workout? of pulling. Yeah. 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 It, was a, it was a full back workout. It was just back. That's all I did. Like I hadn't done just a single muscle like that and really got after it. And so I kind of knew I was going to stretch myself. Uh, and then, like I said, it's, that would have been okay. It w- I really think it was the poor posture after, afterwards. That's when I felt it. Like, so my back was feeling normal sore. So you didn't feel nothing until yeah. after the computer. Yes. I've done the same and then like heavy squatting, deadlifting, all that. And then sitting in my car in traffic for a couple hours and then getting out exaggerated what normally would be just kind of like a small knot that was like okay like my whole leg would be affected in my up into my hip and just be like oh super painful so totally yeah i do i do real like i i see that happening after i do like a real good session but then you're just locked in a shitty position yeah i'm trying to think of why that happens probably because you're well you're causing muscle damage right when you're working out hard so you've got that damage going on so a little bit of inflammation a little bit of soreness is going to start to maybe set in later. The, the body's sending inflammatory markers and things to, to start to repair. But then you're sitting in this, this or standing or whatever in this fixed position. Muscles are stuck in this shortened position. And because you just trained it as hard as you did, the CNS is now protecting that damaged muscle by keeping it shortened. And then when you try to come out of that position now, you, pro- you probably co- you know come out with more pain, which is like when we do MAPS Prime, how we have the, we talk all about the what you do before your workout, but in Prime, we have post-priming 
sessions. And part right. of it is to prevent this, and the other part of it is to send a better oh, signal. Oh, no, 100 percent I know yeah. for a fact that if 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 I chose to do handcuff with rotations and did some like shoulder mobility type of work and actually stretched or had a massage on my back opposed to sitting in a computer for five hours after all that, I wouldn't be feeling Isn't that weird? Way. Yeah. Because we used to get taught like 100%. just sit there and rest and don't. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know how, you know, it's funny. In, That's what rest was, was just like laying down. Don't do sitting. anything. Yeah, not doing anything. I had, God, over the last, maybe the last 15 years or 12 or 13 years of my personal training career, I never, I did not have a single client tweak or hurt themselves during a workout. Mm -hmm. Now, what would happen, what happened a couple times is where I'd be training a client and they'd feel something and they'd be like, ooh, you know, my back feels a little bit or my shoulder's bothering me a little bit. And I was always encouraged my clients to communicate that to me. Yeah. Then the rest of the session would turn into mobility and yes, correctional work. Exactly. So like the last, th so if, oh, you know, we're doing, let's say we're doing chest and shoulder, whatever. And then I see my client moving the arm a little fun. It's like, what's the matter? Is your shoulder? Bone? Oh, it's a little tight. That's it. The rest of the okay, workout. We're working on that. We're working on that. Yeah. And they would always and I'd, they would always have no problem the next day. This was even with with back pain. I think even once I trained Doug mm -hmm. and his back did something funny during a workout. And the rest of the workout, we just stretched it and did mobility. And he was just a little sore the next day. It wasn't. You yeah, know, nothing. Nothing's worse for me than than knowing what I did and then knowing I could have prevented it had I put the work in. Like I knew that I was overstretched, the meaning overstretched myself capacity wise, mm -hmm. not overstretched like stretching. I knew I over overreached, I should say. I overreached when I was training back. So that being said, I should have put in the due diligence post workout and for certain for sure sitting down in a locked position like that after I just lit up my posterior chain would not be an ideal mm -hmm. thing whatsoever. Yeah, because what happens when you're when a, when your body senses injury or when it thinks you're going to get injured, it'll freeze up. Yeah, or, it's got it, a governing it. We've all felt that, right? We've yeah. all felt uh, you know the term locked up. Like, oh, my back just locked up or just seized up. Yeah. What your what your CNS is doing is it's telling a muscle or a group of muscles to cinch down, tighten up, and not move. Yeah. That by itself causes pain, but mm -hmm. then that also goes up and down the kinetic chain in the sense of now the rest of your body is moving and operating differently because of that, and so. One of the best things you could do is tell your central nervous system, "Hey, man, it's okay. Like, yeah. let's stretch, let's move." I just came, so I had an. I like to use analogies because uh, they tend to communicate things better. And this morning, I came up with a really good one. So I was at the front of my house, uh, about to leave with my kids. We came here this morning. I did some filming, and I wanted the kids to. They wanted to watch me do filming, so I brought them to work. And we don't wear shoes in the house. When we come inside the house, we take our shoes off. So I'm at the front. I put one shoe on, and then I realized. Oh, fuck, I, I forgot my wallet, which is on the other side of the house. So rather than taking my shoe off, because we were kind of in a rush, I just walked through the house with one shoe on and one shoe off. Now I'm wearing Converse, okay? And the, 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 the rise off the floor with the Converse is very small. It's a very flat shoe. So we're probably looking at, what would you guys say, half an inch maybe, quarter of an inch off yeah. the floor? Maybe, right? If that, yeah. So I'm walking through the, to the house where one foot is a half, is maybe a quarter inch higher than the other foot, and it dawned on me, well, like this is this would be a great analogy that I could use. So let's say we did an experiment and we took, just to illustrate what I'm trying to explain, and we took a bunch of people, and you could experiment on yourself. You could actually do this, but I warn you, if you do, you're gonna create some problems, so beware. But let's say we took a bunch of people and I put in one of their shoes a one-tenth of an inch riser. Yeah, like a Dr. Soul in one side, but not the other. Just a small, like a one-tenth of an inch riser in one foot just and enough to knock you off kilter just the just you won't even you barely will be able to feel it and in fact if you walk around in it after about 30 minutes you probably won't even notice put this on and walk around in this all day long and here's what will happen here's what will notice if it's on your left foot this will happen before you know it you might not even realize one foot's higher than the other but let, but before you know it your knee starts to kind of bother you a little bit and feel a little tweaky you keep going keep going now your hip on the left side starts to bother you. Then the hip on the right side starts to bother you. Then it goes up to your back. Eventually it goes up to the shoulder, to the neck. You might even start to feel things uh, like headaches and stuff like this as a result of it. Now why, right? If I say to somebody, oh, you have neck and shoulder pain and it has to do with your foot, people think I'm crazy. Not true. It's all connected. It's all connected. So 
when we're talking about what we're talking about with you know injuries or pain and muscles seize up, if you don't address those issues, you're not just going to hurt in the area where that muscle is. It's going to affect the entire right. kinetic chain, and that's why it's so important to address those issues. That's why I think what you do after you work out is almost as important as what you do before. Yeah, you know, and well, I think a lot of times, I mean, those signs and signals are there for a reason. I think a lot of like when injuries occur. Um, especially with athletes, like those little things that seem like, oh, I'm just tight and I got to like barrel through this workout or I got to get through this. Um, you know, that, that signal might've been an indicator like, Hey, if you keep stressing, like, like we're going to give way, like this is, this is not going to work well for you. Like you're going to end up with like damaged tissue, like all these things like that your body was already innately warning you about. Um, can occur and it's it's tough because you know there is a balance to that of like pressing forward and um, you know being able to kind of work through certain discomfort but when your body's you know seizing up and really kind of in protection mode like you really have to like understand the proper way to kind of work out of that it will um, a lot of times people I, I used to have issues with this sometimes I still do have issues with addressing certain problems because I feel like it's taking away from my ability to progress in my workouts. Like, oh man, I got to spend, you know, I got to spend a workout now doing correctional exercise. Oh, there's or spend massive 30. anxiety with that. You feel like yeah. you're like stepping backwards. Right? You feel like you are, but the reality is, it's like people who say, oh, I can't eat healthy because it's expensive. It's actually a lot cheaper than a heart attack, right? It's a lot. It's way more time is wasted when you when you have these problems in terms of progress than if you address them and fix them. So like. Not, I'm using you as an example, not that this is what you saw, Adam, but let's just say in your workout, you felt like your shoulder was a little off. Had you addressed it, or let's say after your workout, had you spent 30, 40 minutes doing shoulder mobility work, you wouldn't have to skip the next couple workouts right. or go see a chiropractor or spend money on that kind of stuff. So it really is, uh, it's at the top of the list, I think, in terms of things you should prioritize is, is just the quality of your movement. And then not to mention... When you move better, you're able to lift heavier. I've had God, I've had clients who I've added 15 pounds to their lift just because we increased their mobility. They didn't get yeah. any more muscle. You know what I mean? It was just they got better mobility, and now they can lift 15 it's more pounds. It's crazy to me. It's like your your abilities increase. Like you're like being able to. Um, you know, like whatever it is, whatever you pursue now, like it opens up so many more doors when you do the kind of work that's necessary to be able to free up certain joints to perform at their best. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of people just think within like, you know, a couple different variables in there, like, well, I, I have to get a stronger bench. And so, you know, this is what I have to do versus, you know, just doing mobility would have, you know, really put you in a better position to then perform better. Dude, when I first learned about rotator cuff exercises, I was 16 or 17. They used to sell in the back of the bodybuilding magazines. It was called, I think it was called the shoulder horn. Do you guys remember this? It was like a blue tube that would go around your neck and then you'd hang your arms over it, and then you'd do rotator cuff exercises. Oh, yeah. Remember Dude, that thing? I do remember that. No, yeah. I don't yeah. remember that. Put it over your neck like this. I remember that. And then you it go goes under your arms, so arm. you rest your arms on it, and then you they take dumbbells. They still have that at this gym I used to go to. And you do rotator cuff exercise for external rotation. And it was, a, it was I mean, a brilliant you know, piece of equipment for the average gym rat, right? It's good feedback, you know, if yeah. you don't know how to just locks you in. get yourself there. So when I was like... It's actually really cool. God, from the age of 14 till probably 20-something, like bench press was like... I have to bench more. Everybody thought that was the that was the that was the it's lift, the golden so, standard. Yeah, which yeah. now I, now I look back with silly, but as a kid, like that's what that was the exercise. So I was always trying to get bigger bench, and then I saw the ad for that shoulder horn uh, device. There it is, there it is, right there. The, it is called the shoulder horn. Check out that guy, the mullet and yeah. stash. That's man. the that same is, exact. By the way, it's the that same exact. A, that ad. guy's a boss. They haven't changed the, the model in the yeah. picture. He's got a mustache and a mullet. <laughs> look at that. Those are kind of cool, dude. Yeah, I, so I can't believe uh, I've never seen one. Uh, of those. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I read, I read in the magazine uh, the ad, and it says, "Get your bench press to go higher by using the shoulder horn." Oh. Uh, now, you know, I, I was a 16 year old fanatical fitness, you know, enthusiast, mm -hmm. and I'd read a lot, and so I started reading the muscles that were affected, and you know, because I also didn't want to spend 75 dollars on this piece of tubing. So all I did was I'd prop my elbow up on a bench mm -hmm. like this, and I just mimicked the exercise. And I, sh shit you not, I shocked myself. Yeah. 
the next week my bench press went up like 10, 10 or 15 pounds. Yeah. And it, I was stuck. I don't remember what weight I was lifting at this age, but it was stuck at this weight and it went up, I think it was like 10 or 15 pounds. It was significant. Yeah. Just from doing the silly exercise, and that's when it—that's when I started to like so put the things light bulb clicked. Yeah, right? I was like, "Oh shit!" Well, it was the same thing with the Indian clubs for me. It was just adding rotation and like like building that in as like something that I actually worked on. And now all of a sudden, like my shoulder joint just felt more stabilized just doing a bench press. It was it would trip me out. Well, I know that from our Zone One test and Prime. That's like that's why you'll always catch me if I'm in here. If I'm lifting chest, you'll see me go over to our wall right here. And do it in either in between sets. yeah in between sets before because I can feel it getting me in the in just in the proper position before I go in there and having to do it intrinsically is so important versus you just doing like I mean it's nice to do rows and do things like that but to be able to connect and do it intrinsically and then go over and then do a bench I always can that's feel the next huge, level for yeah sure. yeah I can feel a huge yeah. difference now the thing about the shoulder horn yeah. that uh, why I won't. now were you doing it now were you doing it uh back then when you were a kid were you doing it like priming before your your, your I, lift, the way or I, did you train it no the way I did it was I first I trained it because I, I recognized that it made my bench stronger and it also made my shoulder feel better and then I used it as a band-aid so anytime my shoulder would hurt I throw those oh, yeah. exercises. It didn't click that it was something that I needed to do regularly. Now, it was much later, and I want to say in my mid 20s, I started to, in particular, do external, you know, humeral rotation, which is for this, for what is it, the supraspinatus or infraspinatus? I can't remember what's yeah, one of the spinatus infra muscles. Or super, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it was the infra, uh, which, one of the spinatus muscles. But then I started doing it at least once a week. To this day, I do exercises like this once a week now the only thing i don't like about the sh that angle of the shoulder horn is if when you lift the arm up like that and work external rotation if you have any shoulder problems at all that is not a safe place <laughs> yeah. to put you that's a, it could be pretty bad so I, I tend to take clients and i would take them and put their arm at their side yeah and do external rotation which is a, a little bit safer like rubber bands yeah. yeah because you have all these you have all these small stabilizer muscles in your body and, you know, again, the way your, your body's quite intelligent in the way that it works. And, and what it does is it will, li your, your strength is limited by what your body thinks you could do without hurting yourself, mm -hmm. right? That's the limit. So right. if, if my max- is a big point on itself. I think that people huge. don't, don't like, they underestimate that fact alone, that if like your body feels like any direction like is going to cause, it, it's a little bit uncertain that you're not going to be stable enough. It's not going to allow, you know, you full access to like what your central nervous system could produce. No. So if you're, if, if you have a maximal output of a hundred, let's say a hundred pounds of squatting strength, let's say that's the full capacity of your body, but your, you know, your ankles or some of your ligaments or your back, your body doesn't think, ah, we can only do 70. Like It's like having a car with a 1,000 horsepower, but realizing that the car, oh, no, we can't floor this because if we hit 1,000 yeah. horsepower, we're going to blow shit up. Yeah. So all we're going we're gonna to set the limiter at 500, right? So that's what your body does, and that is, that's uh, present in most people. Most people listening, the only people I know who've really been able to push their body to the max, and they've tested this, are very, very high-performing strength athletes. Olympic lifters are some of the best in the world. I was just watching a video the other day of this Chinese Olympic lifter. The guy must have weighed, I swear to God, 160 pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, he was a small Chinese dude and he did a fucking clean and he was doing a clean with 400 pounds. Oh, and that, that always just proves to me that like we're capable of so much more strength. You know, everybody is. It's, we, it's a matter of unlocking that because you have to put your body in the right uh, position. You have to be able to mm -hmm. have that feedback that like you know oh my joints are fully supported with this amount of load yeah. well i no think it's problem. the same study that sal's talking about right now isn't it the one that talks about like they're the ones that uh, have been proven or shown to get like 90 something percent of their, their capacity where the average person's more like in the 60s and the 70s yeah yep. yeah. yeah it's like, also why and i've said this before on the show why you hear the stories of the person under extreme duress who's been able who's able to lift something that like the mom who uh, lifted the car off her child in the accident or whatever um, it's because if you you can your body you can uh, override that rev limiter, 
in an extremely stressful situation. There's a, there's a um a series. I don't know if it's on Netflix or not, but it, it's with the guy that um, the actor that played Spock, and he was also in like that show Who? Heroes. Leonard Nimoy. Uh, I think he was the, the original new, the, Spock. No, the new Spock. Oh, never mind. The okay. new Spock guy. Okay. Right. So he does he does a thing like that where he was kind of uh, he was interviewing this guy who basically was like a, a witness to a car crash and so he, he saw this car ex- like it didn't explode but it like went up in flames and there was somebody trapped in it and was like and and so it just um he, he went up and just acted right and he acted and he was trying to to break the window couldn't break the window he actually wedged his fingers into where the door like uh, actually attaches to the car you know where it like wedges was able to shove his fingers all the way in and then he pulled that steel down folded it down to then finally break the glass and then he was able to get out wow so he actually was able to bend steel and they showed it was like i don't know how seven seven hundred something basically impossible thousand pounds yeah <laughs> it was just ridiculous holy like, shit but but it was like pure like uh, you know he had pure access at that at that moment because it was like extreme danger but like then they did all these experiments with it was very interesting when they had him go back to do like this force um output like it was it was it was measuring like how much he could pull off the ground and so just out of his own will like what he could summon like he he only he didn't even get like a fraction of that right like like 700 something and then like he would add in these inclusions of like okay now um, you know, he, he would prep him ahead of time with meditation and then it would increase like substantially. And then after that, he added like an element that was like super, super dangerous and like got him thinking like he was in danger and then boom, it got like even more output. So it was, it was very fascinating. It's so fascinating. So I don't know if I ever told you guys this, but, uh, so when, when I go visit my dad's side of the family in Sicily, um, the, the, the neighbors and whatever, and in my cousin's and my like my older cousins always loved to tell me this same story about when my dad was a kid. So my dad did something similar to that when he was a kid. He was 17 years old. He was home uh, uh, from work because he was sick. He was in his room. He had a fever, I think it was. And he, you know, in in, in Sicily, you live in like floors or whatever. So they live on like there was a second floor or something. Mm-hmm. And he hears he's in bed and he hears my grandmother scream at the top of her lungs okay like like scream like he, he tells a story and the people tell the story that my grandma like the whole neighborhood heard her screaming and what had happened was a man in his it was the god what car was it, it was a small car it was really all the cars were small back then it was a the 500 fiat 500 so it looks like a mini okay so it's a really small car just to paint the picture and the guy's handbrake i guess wasn't set and it rolled over my dad's baby sister who was a lot younger than him. So she was only like two or three or something like that. So my grandma sees this and she starts screaming because it literally rolled over her. The guy gets in the car to try, and but he's all panicked. Everybody's panicked. My grandma's reaching underneath. His baby sister's uh, shirt was tight, was was caught by the, you know, something underneath the car. My dad hurt, hears this up, upstairs jumps from the balcony down, so keep in mind, he's in his underwear, jumps from the second story down to the floor and lifts the car and turns it over on its side to get his sister out. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, my, my dad tells us, I told my dad, I was like, how did you, now my dad's a strong dude, okay, but that's a car, right? Yeah, yeah, that's he, superhuman. He didn't lift weights or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And I said, how, what do you, what, how did that happen? He goes, all I know is, is I heard my mom screaming that my sister got run over. Mm. So he thought his sister was oh, yeah. dead. Yeah. He f- jumps down and he said he lifted it and screamed so loud that he lost his voice. He lost his voice. That's how hard he screamed. And he couldn't move, he said, for a week because he basically injured every muscle uh, in his back. I'm sure. But he was able to flip the car over because he was able to summon you know, his full capacity. Like everything. Yeah. yeah at so one time. Yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. But I mean, here's, I mean, I guess the lesson of this isn't that you need to you know, save a life every time you work out. <laughs> well, governings are important, right? Yeah, so we don't hurt ourselves, but yeah. I've just, it's just interesting to me to, to see like what we're capable as human beings, like what we could tap into. But we are super limited by these, by imbalances and immobilities and these weak stabilizer muscles. And that's why it's, you know, unfortunately, and even look, I, I'm guilty of this. I tend to treat mobility and correctional exercise as a way to help, to, to help alleviate pain. Right. And, to, and, to, and to prevent injury. I, I, I still haven't 
fully utilized it in the in its fullest sense, which is to improve and increase in performance. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Instead of like waiting for the pain signal or, oh, you know, I, I need to do this before I work out. Otherwise, I can't squat all the way down. You know, make it a, a something that's like as important as the workout itself as a performance boosting thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's really where the key is when you're when you're using this kind of stuff is – uh, is to train that particular way. So. You, you guys know that this is uh, our our number one downloaded free guide right now is the one that you just currently wrote on the the back pain. Already? Yeah, yeah. No, I, wow. was just, I was diving in all of our analytics last night, and that's one of the most downloaded guides. And I don't know how many people know this. I know you mentioned it at the end of the show. Sometimes I don't know how people tune out right away, but you know we've we've created this like r- library of. What probably twelve? I think there's ten now, maybe. Tw- those are ten. Yeah, there's more that have to get finished. Right, and there's yeah. yeah, there's a lot that we hope to fill that whole thing up of these free guides that are on there, and the, the latest one that that's gone live is the the back pain one. It's a really really good read for you guys, and it's totally free. It's at mindpumpfree.com that you guys can download that. Well, app. back pain is that's such a common. When I wrote that guide, I looked up statistics. Did you guys know that about right at this moment? Like at any given moment, about thirty percent of Americans are suffering from chronic back pain. Yeah. Oh, I believe it. And and the thing about back pain, like people get like hopeless with it. Like it's it's really debilitating. You know, like if you wake up every day and you got this pain, this sharp pain, and you think that your only option is surgery, and you're trying to avoid it, mm-hmm. but you're still trying to be active, and it's like painful. Everything you do, it's tough. Man. That's why I think it's probably one of the most downloaded yeah. right well, now. Well, most for that reason. most back pain is not because somebody hurt themselves. No, it's, no, it's just this chronic yep. back pain that's coming from you bad know, posture, bad positioning, yeah, bad patterns. And, and you wonder why? Because back pain in the you know 500 years ago was because you hurt your back or because you were breaking rocks or lifting things, right? Today, the reason why we our back pain hurts is our life is uh, we sit a lot, and so we sit in these positions that shorten, uh, you know, like our hip flexor muscles. Uh, we disengage our, our core muscles, and so we have this weird recruitment pattern that we develop, where we become very hip flexor dominant, which kind of pulls the back in this kind of strange position. You don't have good core stability on top of it. Um, we don't have good hip mobility, like the or ankle mobility. So the average person can't get in a squat. You know, if you take the average person off the street and tell them get down in a squat, they can't do it. Mm-hmm. So you just combine that, and it's just a recipe for disaster. Because the back is, the the lower back is uh, incredibly resilient if it's healthy. If it's healthy, yeah, it can do a lot of amazing things, and you'll it's a very mobile joint, very stable. So it's not a um, it's not a hard fix in the sense that well, it's it's a simple fix usually. Like how many times have you guys had a lower back client, you know, pain client? And it's like the same formula, you know what I mean? You do right. a few, these, these few movements. Just putting them in better positions a lot of times will you, you have an immediate kind of a result. And um, that's always like, a, you know, that's something that I I love to see that. I love to see when people's pain sort of gets relieved. But they, they just, you see in their eyes there's something they can do to kind of address this, which I think is is kind of the hopelessness, right? They think they don't have something yeah. that they could do to help. Well, well, a good way to show people too, it's not that I used to I used to lay a, lay a client and say, oh, I have a bad back or my back is always bothering, it bothers me right now. Like I would lay them on their back and then have them just hug their knees to show them how much release that would give them, like how much better they feel in that position. It's like, this is how you know it's not like you have a bad back. It's like, you have poor posture that's putting stress on your low back. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem really is. And because when you roll down, when you open up the spine like this, when I make you hug your knees, like all of a sudden it gives you this instant relief. And that's just because you're in this poor position all day long that it's constantly bugging Mm -hmm. you and driving crazy. It's not, you don't have a bad back. We have bad posture. Most valuable by far from a business perspective, the most valuable thing that I offered as a trainer the tool that I had in my tool belt that was the most valuable easily was my ability to uh, help people Correct with pain. This. I, yeah. I, no, I agree. Correctional exercise. By That's far. Why I always tell, trainers always ask me like what I Those think. Those are the best clients. Like the most valuable certifications that I've had. And for sure, you, having a good foundation. I know we, we rep Paul Check a lot because I really like a lot of the stuff that he puts out there now. And I know we talk a lot about FRC and stuff like that. But, you know, the NASM CES was probably one of the most impactful certifications for me because it's just it's a corrective exercise specialist. It's a good one, too. And it's it's literally what if you're a trainer, if you're an actual trainer, that's literally 60 to 70 percent of your clientele. That's, you know, applicable to like literally that's what most people 
come in, even though they have to lose weight, they want these, most of them are dealing with some sort of a chronic pain and most of it's related to how they move. Mm-hmm. And if you can address that, and so that certification, in my opinion, is one of the best certifications that a personal trainer can have. Dude, you want to separate yourself from your peers and you want to you want to bring a lot of value, you become the answer to your client's pain. Mm -hmm. So somebody comes in, they want to lose weight, they want to whatever. If you're also the trainer that, oh, my back hurts, I need to call you. Or, oh, they know how to, or I've never gotten injured or I've moved better. Oh my, it's it's actually more valuable. I'll tell you what, the clients that I've trained who I've solved their pain issues, they value me way more than the clients who've lost 50 pounds with me. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's, I mean, for sure. 100%. Living with chronic, you know, pain and stuff like that, people don't realize what a terrible, exi- that can be a very terrible existence. And when you can be the answer to that as a trainer, right? especially, especially, especially without medication. That, I was just going to say, yeah. especially because Western medicine usually doesn't have an answer for that. Like, how many times have I, have you guys had clients who've had pain and they say, oh, my shoulder hurts, but I went to the doctor, get an MRI, had surgery, like nobody knows what's going on. So they basically just, you know, okay, well, I got to accept the fact that my shoulder's just always going to hurt. Right. And then you do correctional exercise with them and their shoulder pain's gone, client for life. Right. You know what I'm saying? The thing, the thing that scares me is when you get people like my uncle who have allowed it to go for so long that they, they feel hopeless at this point. Mm-hmm. It's so, they're so far down of, you know, not addressing it. And that it's just like fuck it. It's There's just too much work, right? Yeah. To start over and it, do things differently. Yeah, it's 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 really really it's really tough to be in the position that we are in, or I'm in that situation where you see someone you love and you care about. You know the steps they need to take, but you also know that there's nothing magical I can teach them or tell them. A lot of it is they have to do all the prerequisites yep. to get to a point to where their body will start moving you know, correctly for them. And a lot of that work is really tedious and little. That's the stuff that sucks. Like The move that I'm talking about where I say the zone one test and prime for those that don't own it, it's like, it's such a silly, tedious move, but it's a fucking game changer, yeah. and it's something. It's addressing. You something have to do it. I have to do. Like I yeah. have to do it because I spend the other eighty percent of my day in this rounded position on a computer, or on a cell phone, or sitting on a uh, sitting in a chair talking on a podcast. Mm-hmm. It's so important that I do that. Otherwise, well, I had done the same. You path. know, you know that's the reason why we we had to kind of build in entertainment every day. Like I looked at myself as like I have to like have to like distract and and you know make sure that we're having fun through this process because it is tedious it is there there are these things like that that are super crucial super important to do on a very regular basis that will seem mundane and then you know a lot of people will just like you know that's it for me i'm done with it but like as as a good coach like you can still you know keep revisiting these things but have your client really uh, enjoy the process. Mm. Do you guys have go-to like moves that like you either do personally yourself or that you or that you normally teach? Like this is like for most people, yeah. this is game changer. Well, so these- w- one of the things that I would do, one of my hallmarks as a trainer was if I, if one of the most common posture issues that you'll see with clients that's easy to show someone is uh, rounded shoulders and forward head. Okay, so it's like upper cross, right? So the shoulders mm-hmm. are rounded, forward head. Most people have it. It's getting more popular than than even when I first started became a, became a trainer. Now you see it in kids because kids are on their their electronic devices so often, and it's also an easy one to point out to a client. It was also an easy one for me to immediately show somebody how much better they can feel, and I would always focus on this in my assessment because it's funny when you get people that come in that want to try and hire that, that are thinking about hiring you and you do an assessment with them. And they talk about losing weight and stuff. Yeah, you could talk about losing weight and what you can do and all that stuff. But if you could show them immediate relief in some kind of pain or dysfunction, they're going to hire you. Almost mm-hmm. nine, nine out of ten times, they're going to end up, you know, hiring you as a personal trainer. So they would come in. They, I would do my assessment. Inevitably, they'd have forward shoulder, and I'd show them here's forward shoulder, here's forward neck, and they'd be like, oh yeah, I could definitely see that. And then I would. I'd end up sounding like a psychic, and I'd say, "You probably have a tight neck," and I know that because when you're forward shoulder, I know that the the muscles of the you know attached to the neck tend to be tight because that's the the position you're in. They'll be like, "Oh my God, you're right," and mm-hmm. these muscles aren't firing here. Then I'd sit them down and I'd have them do a cable row, really lightweight, and I'd stand behind them 
and I'd put my hands on their shoulder. First, I'd say, okay, I want you to row for me on your own because I want to see how you move. And of course, they would row and there'd be no scapular retraction. It would all be in the biceps and the mm-hmm. forward shoulder. And I'd say, okay. So I'd say, your, your mid-back isn't firing just like I thought. I said, now what I want you to do is I want you to grab that bar. We're going to do a cable row again. This time, I'm going to sit behind you and I'm going to place you into proper position. So then I'd stand behind them. I'd have them sit. I'd have them brace their core, stick their chest out. They'd pull back, and then I'd place my hands on their shoulders. Sometimes I'd have to put my knee in their mid-back, but usually I wouldn't, and I'd pull their shoulders back. And all of a sudden, they'd have this look on their face like, whoa, my shoulders move in that direction? And then I'd have them, I'd pull their shoulders back, and I'd tell them to push them down, don't elevate them, squeeze back, and then all of a sudden, you'd see them start to connect to those mid-back muscles. And then I'd, I'd say, okay, now hold it here. And I'd let go and I'd train them to be able to do that. Then I'd have them put the bar back. I'd have them stand up and I'd say, how do you feel? And every single one would be like, holy shit, my shoulders feel good. My back feels good. My neck feels good. Boom, client, every single time. Because I'd show them right then and there, here's what I can do for you. That was my go-to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's been, that was one of my go-to moves. Same thing? Had. Yeah, I think I think that's a pretty standard move for a trainer because uh-huh. upper cost syndrome is so common. It, but I think the biggest one that I have incorporated now and this really didn't happen until brink like brink was the one who really opened my eyes up on two big moves that have been game changers for me which is the 90 90 and then the combat stretch Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's just because i'm a a tall lanky guy and so it's made such it's made so much more of an impact on me or what because i deal with i had always it issues i always had low back stuff going on like I always had this low, especially when I started training, because once I started training and lifting heavy, all that stuff would lock up and get tight on me, and it would be really frustrating. And the the ninety ninety has been, you know, it's been con- constant work too. Like I'm still nowhere where I'd like to be, but I've made leaps and bounds from where I was. I mean, I had like no internal hip rotation at all. Like I was not able to control that when I first started. Like he, I remember the first time he, oh, put he his, lifts your foot. Yeah. He, the first time he put me in the feels night, like it's not even your foot. Right. right yeah. Mm-hmm. He, first time he did that. And I was just like, I remember the first time he just asked me to lift it. I'm like, it, it doesn't lift. You can't lift it. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. they'd be like, yes, you can. And then he'd lift it. I'm like, Oh shit. Like, Holy cow. I'm so disconnected. But now I can, I can really control that. And I've made a lot of progress. And because of it, I can feel the difference in the relief that I have. So it's now become a staple position that I teach almost every single person that I come across that, that, that ever talks about any low back issues, which I think that that's the thing that I think is unique is you think low back. And so people right away think, oh, what do I need to do to my, I need to stretch my back. What are some, my back? Yeah. yeah. What are my back stretches that I need to do? And, but the whole hip complex is, is such a complex area and there's so many muscles that are inserting and connecting in that, that if your hips are really tight, that it ends up pulling on the low back. And nine times out of 10, it's related to those things. It's related to what you have going on mm-hmm. and the inability for you to internally or externally rotate the hips. And that same thing kind of goes for the shoulder when you talk about upper cross syndrome. I mean, these are multifaceted joints that what makes them so special and unique is they don't move in these same direct planes like a lot of our other joints, right? No, it's it's uh, yeah. what's the shoulders like the hip of the upper body. Right. Yeah, yeah arguably their mobility, their, their dynamic mobility is also uh, why they're so susceptible uh, to problems. I mean, the most one of the most common upper body issues to hurt is the shoulder right. and the mid-back. It's all related because you get the scapula, you get the shoulder, moves in all these different directions or whatever. It's not like, the, like how often do people's elbows hurt? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't see a lot of chronic elbow pain. You get some tennis elbow, but that's not elbow right. related. That's more that's related to the it's wrist. More over pattern. Yeah, yeah that's that's like related to the wrist. Injury. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting to think back about like some go tos like it really was built and developed into prime. Like now that I think about like I used the stick when I would even evaluate and do squat assessments and hip hinging and very basic basic things that you think. Uh, everybody just knows how to do, you know, like innately, they know how to squat. They know how to like hinge in the difference between those two. But it was a very, very much of a learning curve for me to be able to learn how to teach that to people that they just didn't connect to their body like that, or they didn't realize how much their body disengaged through this movement. You become a, it's, you know, you're walking around in this, this shell, this body, and you, you become a prisoner of it if you don't, you know, take care of these things. Your body, it will learn or it will unlearn 
things depending on if you if you do them or if you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you unlearn them, they're gone. The only way you can get them back is if you consciously try to reteach the body. And, you know, it's a tough place to be in. You don't want to be stuck in prisoner in this shell that now can't twist or bend over or reach up above their head or whatever. And it doesn't, that's not where it starts, by the way. That's the, that's, that's typically after years and years of ignoring other issues or even fitness fanatics. I mean, we have friends in the industry that keep having the same fucking injuries, yep. like the same back injuries, the same hip injuries. It's like, yo man, like you're not listening. And at some point you're going to get an injury so bad that now you're going to be screwed. You're not going to be able to rehab it. Like it, it's especially true of people in, in, in our space who tend to do this over and over type of thing. And it's like, you know, you think you're saving time by not spending, you know, any energy doing these things, but the reality is you're costing yourself oh, yeah. a lot of time. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And not only that, but you're also, you're also costing yourself a lot of performance right. uh, along the way. So, so we mentioned our free guides. If you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can see all of them and you can download all of them. They all cost nothing and there's no limit to how many of them you can get. So go to mindpumpfree.com and check those out. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.